Good evening and welcome to the first of a series of webinars presented by Kaka and Ka and Uruku Media. Uruku, the principal producers of the film Stum or Tree, of which you just saw the trailer. It was also shown at Kaka and Ka earlier this year and is currently available on DSTV box office. My name is Gideon Lombard and I will be your moderator, facilitator, conversationist. I'm an actor and I play in the film Stum. And the topic for this evening's conversation is the trauma of the caregiver. I should say that all the conversations over the next couple of days have their basis in the film. So the trauma of the caregiver uh, is a topic that I think addresses trauma, a kind of trauma that is often um, un undescribed or overlooked. And I am joined by a formidable panel of caregivers in one definition of the word or another. So without further ado, I will introduce you to this formidable panel. Siska van Straten. Siska is the sister of Lo Fenter, who is the writer and director of the film Stum. But Siska is also a nurse and a midwife. She qualified in 1998. She worked in the public maternity service till 2001. Uh, from 2002 till 2013, she worked in a private midwifery practice. And since the, from 2013 until now, she worked in shared private and public maternity services and education. Welcome, Siska. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we are joined by Catherine Brown. Catherine is a wannabe, eccentric, pickle-making, bread-baking, sexy grandmother living on a farm and co-sleeping with her chickens. But in reality, she is a mother living in Plumstead, Cape Town with her freaking cool daughters and her dreamy husband. She is more than happy with that for now. But she is also a doula and a childbirth educator, guided by and leading with her heart. Birth work is her vocation and passion and feels such gratitude to be doing what she loves. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you very much. Next, we have a dear friend and a colleague, Inge Beckmann. Inge is a multidisciplinary artist who reinvents herself in every medium she engages. Known for her wide-ranging work on national and largely international films and series like The Dark Tower, Shepherds and Butchers, Dominion, to name but a few. She is equally at home on stage and is known for her prolific work as one of South Africa's most unique musical voices in groups like Lark, Beast, and various solo sound and music projects. Regardless of the medium she works in, she employs all resources and systems at her disposal, the physical, emotional, and mental, to create work of meticulous detail, curiosity, and depth. In her own words, she's a prophetic feeler. Inga plays the role of Chantal in the film Stum, the tree. Hello, Inga. Hello, hello. I would like to welcome Lucinda Evans. Lucinda and her organization are the first responders to all calls of gender-based violence for Lavender Hill and the six surrounding informal settlements. People call Lucinda because they know they can rely on her and police responses are often delayed. Lives are lost during this crucial time. Lucinda calls the police, but she is often the first and only on the scene. When there are shootings, she ferries the victims to the ambulances waiting outside the informal settlements. When there are fires and floods, Lucinda goes in to help. 
For 12 years, she used her husband's Toyota Taz, but she literally drove it into the ground. Three babies were born in that car. She once had 15 injured children and adults in that small car and has loaded sink platter and gum poles countless times to rebuild shacks after fires or new homes for abused women and children. She is doing the work our government should be doing. Her phone is always on 24 seven. She is always on call and puts her own life at risk. She is currently on BBC's top 100 most inspiring women in the world and has been knighted by the French government for her community work. Welcome, Lucinda. Thank you, Fidion. Hello, everybody. And lastly, I would like to welcome Lindsay Thomas. I should say that Lindsay is joining us all the way from the Underberg and her, her internet connection comes and goes. But uh, for time being, in her own words, Lindsay says, I am not a talker, I am a doer. Lindsay was happily working in the South African film industry when she met her first quote-unquote street child. From that day onward, she could not ignore the fact that children were growing up on our streets. She went on a crusade to understand their stories, a journey of migration to figure out why kids leave rural areas and end up on the streets. In 1988, she started Street Universe, an NGO for children. Nothing could have prepared me for the daily trauma I lived, seeing the abuse of children who had been labeled into categories of funding so we could make sense of what was happening in our society. In 2000, she, her son Wesley and Wiseman Dinizulu started the My Life Foundation, focused on getting people off the streets and reintegrated into society. In over a decade, the foundation has received numerous very moving success stories. In 2012, she left Cape Town for Namakwe in the Eastern Cape, where she, together with a global ambassador and philanthropist, set about building a village positioned in the middle of 52 of the country's poorest villages. By breaking through strong racial barriers, their wellness center provides treatments to the rural population. They teach children about climate change, sustainable farming, and to build homes from recycled material. Speaking about the children, Lindsay says, to, these little people to see these little people educated and supported through their lives, to be the future leaders of South Africa, to this cause I have dedicated my life. Welcome everyone and welcome Lindsay. It is a, it is a huge honor for me to be a part of this conversation and uh, yeah, thank you to Kakan Khan and Ruku Media for having us all. Um, I've prepared a couple of questions, but I think to everyone here, the nature of this conversation is quite open. So whenever you feel you have a question or something to say, please feel free to chip in. But I think I'll, uh, I'll kick us off. I'll set us in a, a direction by starting where we all start, and that is with birth. So I have a, I have a question for Siska and for Catherine. Um, and that is mainly uh, what, uh, what pressures do various systems or societies exercise on you as a midwife? And does the processing of trauma form part of the education of a nurse or a midwife or a doula? Kath, hmm. I'm going to just say something first. Um, I quickly, actually, before this, um, this panel discussion, had I had to phone a colleague, a younger colleague, um, and I asked her that question. I asked her whether she has been prepared during her training. She's about 25 years younger than me, and she's currently, um, you know, a newly qualified midwife. And she said, absolutely, absolutely. They did a lot of um, burnout um, education, the different stages, what to do, how to recognize it. Um, but I'm sad to say that I do not remember it from my training. It may be that I do not remember it and it perhaps did take place, but certainly not. And, and, um, and um, you know, trauma is something that we are exposed to all the time in the nursing profession. And then around birth, we see a lot of things that are very traumatic and not knowing how to deal with it over many, many, many years does have a great impact. But I think, you know, I think 
perhaps I must just let Kath also have a a, a word there. Um, I hope that answers your question, Gideon. Yeah, I, I think I had a similar experience to you, Cisco, in the sense that um, I don't recall it coming up in my training year at all. Um, and if it did, it wasn't of, uh, you know, not detailed or in-depth enough for it to have hit um, a chord of, you know, realizing that this was a factor um, as I was, you know, coming into a profession that was still new. It didn't even cross my mind. And I, I, I find that as I created a community with our fellow doulas and other birth workers, um, the topic came up more and more. And I think it's really there within the community of, of um, finding each other that we have found a way to deal and just even talk about it. So it's, you know, being able to leave a traumatic birth and being able to pick up the call as uh, pick up the phone and just chat to someone who understands it. Um, you know, as much as my family are compassionate and understanding, it doesn't quite work, <laughs> you know, trying to, mm -hmm. you know, deep on, a, on a, tra a, a traumatic experience. So, um, but that's definitely not something I learned in training in, in while we were, you know, studying, definitely not. But it is something that's very much part of how we, we work. Um, and we're always open to receiving calls and know that we can pick up the call, pick up the phone and call when we need to. I uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I uh, my my father always said, "Don't suffer in silence." So the the dealing of trauma that I'm familiar with is always uh, has been a conversational one. It's not a it's not a solitary endeavor. But I think one more thing that I want to touch on in uh, with with uh, Siska and Catherine is there's the trauma of witnessing the birth and giving birth. But uh, there's another trauma associated with uh, postpartum depression. And my question is, where, where does the role of the midwife or the doula end with, uh, with regards to this? Hmm. So, so, Gideon, it will be many different answers depending on which um, sort of capacity you are working in you know so in the capacity of a private midwife where you have a patient that you follow through right through antenatally and then during the birth and postnatally it can continue beyond you know the two-year period at which we actually technically um, um, pin postnatal the possibility of postnatal depression coming up um, I've had the most incredible experiences over the years with women that I've put in my car, driven to a trauma unit to be evaluated in order to be possibly admitted, in order to safeguard her or her child's safety, um, to people who just stay in contact over years and years, you know, and then they had, an, you know, an, a second baby and um, possibly the same um, um, problems occur again. Um, but in our provincial setup, I think that is where the, the midwives really, really struggle because there isn't a, a, a continuous um, care. You know, you 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 see a different midwife at, at at a different visit, and then you don't know who it is that's going to be do, delivering the baby. And then postnatally, there's one or two um, days in hospital if it's a Caesar or three days, and if it was a normal birth, some women leave the hospital after six hours and then it is arriving at a clinic on day three or day seven or not at all and that is where I think most of our women fall through the cracks because potent natal depression is is huge and it has dire consequences on those mothers and babies into the years ahead and they are mixed and midwives are powerless um, I, I believe wow yeah, I just want to add to that. I think, you know, Cisco really touched on a, a quite an important um, point in the, the fact that there are different structures, even, you know, as a midwife, you're getting the private midwives who are forming 
to the best of my knowledge, forming quite close relationships prenatally during the birth and postnatally with their clients. And there becomes a, the, that connection is very is felt by both sides in that relationship. Um, and when that connection is felt, it is, um, as she says, that can, it's something that continues. So if there were an issue that were to ra uh, that came up um, for the mother, she would feel more, far more comfortable reaching out to um, to one of you know one of the private midwives that she had had that relationship with, um, but it, that's not prevalent in neither in our in our public sector nor in our private sector midwife setups that we have. That we have, I think that's also where the doula's role really um, shines in a way, especially for those families that are going to, having hospital births, because there is that relationship that is formed, which means that when issues come up. Um, it, it, there is someone to turn to. Um, I mean, I can even speak to my own experience. Siska was actually at both of my my daughter's births, and a connection was formed. If I know without a doubt, even if I had issues arise, uh, you know, come up a year down the line, which sometimes postnatal depression, it's not it, it's not something that necessarily happens in the in the first six weeks. It can, you know, come into play later down when they need to go back to work or whatever. I would have been able to pick up that phone and phone Siska without a hesitation at all. And I know that she would have steered me in the wrong direction, in the right direction of how to get help. But that is not, that is almost a, a place of privilege that I think um, a huge amount of our, our population don't have. And I think um, that's why we struggle with post, why postpartum depression is such a thing. There is not the connection, the community, the, um, um, someone seeing the different flags, they just seem a once off, you know, those, these, yeah, these nurses are seeing clients once off and there's no comparison to how they were and to how they now. So things are getting missed and falling through the cracks, as Siska said. And, and um, just sorry, Gideon, just to add that it's not an ignored issue. You know, our, our government system is so unbelievably um, overburdened, our maternity services, and there's been projects of over the last 25 years that I've been um, touching in, you know, touching base in, in, in government and private systems. Amazing people. These um, Dr. Simon Honigman, who was part of a amazing project to help specifically drive PND um, in the public sector and screen women anti to put them, you know, the women who are at risk. And it has been incorporated in our maternity case record, which is the, government booklet that we use but the problem is that part of that tool the screening tool reads do not do this survey if there isn't an adequate referral system at hand so don't screen for the problem if you don't have anything to do if you don't have a referral system and many parts of our country um, are mm -hmm. unable to deal with this potential problem. Um, but you must be careful, you must mute me because I can talk on this for a very long time. <laughs> so let's move on. No, thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, my uh, my girlfriend is currently a doctor in the public sector. So I, I have a lot of these conversations and, uh, but I think uh, it, it segues quite uh, nicely to something where I want to, uh, where I want to ask Lucinda into the conversation. Um, so, Lucinda, with, with your line of work and coming from uh, Siska and Catherine's, is what is is there a trauma caused by uh, struggling to cope with a constantly failing social system or a police system or a, a, a public medical system? Is there is there a, a, a trauma almost attached to yeah seeing what could be possible and it just doesn't happen over and over again. Um, I, I'm very excited when I heard Siska and Catherine speak. I, I just want to tell all of you that I have a baby saver in the wall of my house. And um, in the beginning, when I spoke about a baby saver, I was lynch, literally. Uh, people were saying that I was promoting women to throw the babies away. I was being uh, called short of being a witch. But when that first baby arrived, I had 35,000 comments on my Facebook page. 
and more than half of, of people wanted the baby. And I completely understand when women that are in a domestic violence situation, or let me let me take it a step back. She's pregnant, she's in love, and the partner abuses and abandons her. You, you can take your pick. And she is along, she doesn't have a plan, she doesn't have a home, and she's about to give birth. Um, and the choices that a lot of women don't have is that they don't know how to access a baby saver. And the reason why I, I'm passionate and I want to start about taking over from birth is that many of the women have not had form attachment with their own mother when they were young and when they were uh, born. And so the baby saver came about when somebody dropped a newborn baby still with an umbilical cord in a shop right bag in front of my door. Somebody knew who I was and how passionate I was about children and women. And that prompted me to put the baby saver in, in the wall. Um, and for frontline workers like us, we do not have the ability to have spaces to debrief. Um, how I survived with everything that I've seen and with things that I've experienced is by pure grace and a, and a beautiful women's group up in Claymont at the Grail Center, Women's Grail Center that I'm able to run to. But for us as frontline workers, we do not have the luxury to, you know, sometimes sit and unpack what the hell happened to us now in a shack fire where it's not just one shack that burns, it's multiple shacks and you have a thousand plus people in one go, destitute. More than half of them are women with their children. And within the first 24 hours, some women start the period immediately as a result of trauma. And so when we, somebody like me go and I respond, the first, my narrative is looking at the family in general, but my, I tend to look at women and children. In that first 24 hours, she's only there with her gown, huddled with the children amongst the ashes. There's nothing. The, and, and, and I forever ask people, what is our immediate plan? So most people do not want to leave the situation because what they were able to save, they have to safeguard. And most of the, the people that are affected are single-headed households, which is women with their children. And so the meager belongings that they have, they will sit at the side because somebody will come along. And unfortunately, it is a man that will steal it and be violent and take it from the person. And so from our experience, the very first in the first 24 hours is to ensure that everyone has a hot meal. And people say, why are you bringing food when it's chaos? Why are you bringing hot food? Why are you bringing sweet things for children? Um, why do you fight with the authorities to open up community centers to at least the women and children can have a bath and a shower. Because I understand when some women are traumatized, immediately they start their period and it's unplanned. You don't, you don't plan for this. You don't plan to be traumatized. And so for us as frontline workers going into that situation, sometimes it's very difficult to keep the level of calmness because it's chaotic. It's in the middle of the night. It's dark. The wind is blowing, and I, if I reflect on what happened last in October in the informal settlement in Overcome, we literally stood there and we saw how half of the scam burned down and the fire engines weren't able to access. And there was this mass devastation of people crying, men and boys and children. And for us that arrived there, we had to bring some sort of calmness and normality. And you cannot walk, walk away from such a scene and not being personally affected. Um, I couldn't sleep that night. I couldn't wait for the sun to be up so that we can start, you know, mobilizing and getting things in place so that we could bring, because for the men that was affected in their mind, it was, I have to rebuild my house. I have to get the roof over my, my family's head. I have to see to the children. And for the women that were affected, it was about how am I going to rebuild? And so for me as the outsider, to a point I had to use my 
my activist voice and tell some of those men, you will help this woman build. You are in charge of this family. You will build for you and you will also build for your family. Yeah, we are. Thank you. Um, I'm going to I'm going to switch over to Afrikaans for a bit. I'm going to mix it up. Is that fine? Is it OK? Is it lacquer? Catherine, I see your hand down. Yeah, I think, you know, Lucinda really points to uh, the this first stage of such a massive problem that we have for care providers, not necessarily something that I feel, but it's something that I see in the sense that when care providers, like Lucinda is talking about seriously traumatic experiences that she's witnessing, and when you know, I see it very clearly in our MOUs, that, you know, from time to time I do um, like volunteering at the MOUs, particularly one in Makassa, um, and you're seeing these traumatic, you know, the, 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 the midwives, they are seeing very traumatic things every single day. So there becomes this backlog and this buildup of um, mammoth heaviness, I don't even know what to call it, I just get... Um, uh, I feel the weight of it just even talking about it. Um, and then what we see is it's an inability to cope with the magnitude of the trauma. And that's when you see this shift of um, these nurses that are often inherently compassionate, inherently wanting are caring people because that's why they're in the field. Um, but they just can't anymore. And that's when they switch to being the opposite of compassionate. They become um, abusers and they become, yeah. um, they add yeah. the trauma. And that is, uh, I think, our biggest issue that we face is how do we stay as care providers, stay in that role of compassion that people, like, if, can you imagine all this compassion that we're hearing from Lucinda that she gives out to these people offering them meals, getting them to open up the community service. If she couldn't do that anymore because yeah. of what she witnessed, it's such a loss. And I think that is happening across our care group, especially our public sector, across the board. They just can't anymore. And we're dealing with horrific, horrific um, abuse there because they are under-resourced. So they are overworked, they are underpaid, underappreciated, and on top of that own personal trauma that they're getting, they're witnessing horrific things and they've just got nothing left to give, but actually the opposite of compassion and it's tragic to witness. Yeah, yeah, it's thank you. Yeah, I've seen these a few hands up, but I think that is precise. Um, my my vraag uh, vir jylle allemaal eindelijk, en Inge, ons gaan nou by jou spesifieke benadering kom van, van die acteers trauma en wat, of die kreatieve skeppings trauma en wat dit alles by ons. Maar, as ek luister na jylle, dan, die, die eerste vraag wat by my opkom is, een, waar kom die energie vandaan? Waar kom die energie om dit aan te hou en aan te hou en aan te hou? Jy weet, Lucinda, as, as jy sê, jou phone is, it's on 24-7, jy weet, daar is nie een shift, or you're not on call, jy weet, at a hospital, or so, jy is die heel tyd aan, so dis die, dis die een vraag, is waar kom die energie vandaan, maar dan tweedens ook, in termen van jylle trauma, die, die caregiver, die verzorgerse trauma, is waar gaan sit dit, waar gaan sit dit, is dit een fysische ding, is dit een hartseer, is dit een depressie, is dit, jy weet, Catherine, soos wat jy nou sê, is verander het die mense benadering tot dit wat jy doen, verhard het jou, ja, jy weet, so eerstens, waar kom die energie vandaan, want ek denk nie, ek sal dit kan doen nie, nie die hele tyd, nie constant nie, en waar kom dit dit dan, ja, en dit is ook vir jy nog nie maar, Ek wil net by add, um, en, en ek wil politie, uh, politie officiere wil ek include, en, somtijds verstaan is die hoekom die politie reageer soos hulle reageer hee, en ons verwacht dat die die vrouwe en mans van een brand moet gaan na een moord, en dan moet dit hulle moet in die selfde shif met hulle deel met, met die verkrachting en dan met die dood. En om na daar nie vir hulle protection basis en holding basis en holding space basis is die, bekom die politiebeamte, net as Catherine gesê het in, in haar field, dat die meest, van die meest compassionate mense, bekom desensitize. 
en frontline workers soos ons, ons kyk na hulle en ons sê, jylle doen nie jylle werk, jylle wil ons sê help jy, um, en ons beklui met hulle, en vir een lang tyd was, was dit my narrative, en ek moes my narrative verander toe ek begin volunteer as a community police forum persoon, om te sien wat binnen in die organisatie aangaan. Nou, advocate ek op elke platform, dat ons moet begin dink aan care for the caregiver. Dis nie net vir die politie nie, dis vir mense wat met die ambulance werk, dis vir faie mense, dis vir, dis vir die municipale mense, um, en dis vir ons, wat hou vir my aan die gang, Gideon, is, ek het so a brandende passie, wat ek kan quantify, ek kan nie vir julle sê, wat het is nie, dit, dit was altyd daar, um, ek is mens mens, um, ek word getrek die, die goed wat my hart roer, en dis harde werk, dit is die makkelijke werk, dit is baie traumatiese werk, want vir 8 jaar was my organisatie binnen in my familiehuis, so my kinders het groot geword, met mense wat kom, vrouwe en mans, gebroke en stikken en geslaan en verkracht, en ons maak die voordeel oop, iemand le daar buiten kan geslaan, en ek moes a protection leie vir my, vir my man en my kinders bou, rondom, dat ons het geliv love in action, en die love in action het vir ons syn gehou, dat het vir ons dier donke daar gedra, dat het vir ons dier mei daar gedra, want as jy nie iets het wat jy aanhou nie, vir my, ek glo in onbaatsichtelike liefde, um, waar het manifest, en manifest in my hare, ek kan nie my hare groei nie, um, want so draai ek my hare begin groei, is het planke toe, um, en so mense vraag vir my stress jy nie, so ek sê, my hare, ek kan nie my hare groei nie, en dis ok, ek het vrede ja. gemaakt, dat ek gaan nie hare het nie, en um, my ander deel van my personality moet ook maak vir die kort hare, maar ons, en ek is een frontline worker, <laughs> ek rek het naais ook, en ek advocate, evens meer, vir kee vir die kee gewe, want COVID het vir ons nie net ge, geinfekie, maar het van ons so geaffekteer, dat dit is evens, as ons gedink het, dit was moeilik voor maart, om ons werk te doen, dit is honderd keer meer moeiliker, van nou werk ons met violence, maar ons werk ook met emotional and psychological violence, wat gemanifest het, um, as gevolg van COVID, omdat mense so lang toegesluit moes gewees het, en geforceer gewees het, om in een spuis te wees. Ja, wel, jo, baie dankie, ek, ja, Catherine, ek, ek, ek ons hart op, nie uit tyd uit nie, maar jy sta, ek het soveel vraag, ek het soveel vraag, en Inge, ek is, ek is nou daar by jou, maar Catherine, asjeblief, ja, yes. Yeah, I'll be quick. I just want to say, Lucinda's hit the nail on the head with regards to how to tackle it, you know, if, if compassion needs to come, you have to feel the compassion to give the compassion. So, you know, how we deal with it, how we get the energy is the question you asked is, I get it from my family. When I come back from being at a birth for the last 15 hours, 24 hours, they are exceptionally compassionate and understanding and supportive of picking up the pieces that I've dropped or letting me sleep for the next 12 hours. Um, and it's when I receive that compassion that I can go out and give more. And I think if I had to come home and I had people who didn't get it and were just like carry on and I had to, had, you know, it, it, it would be impossible to maintain it. And I think having that realization really helped me show the compassion to these nurses that I often see in these MOUs that are really struggling. As soon as you just load them with understanding because of what they're going through and, you know, load them with love and compassion, you can literally before your eyes see them shift into being more compassionate and being able to have more to give. You can't give if you don't you know, you've got to receive to be able to give. I mean, I think a lot of our care providers are in, are in life situations where they just don't receive enough, um, you know, compassion, understanding, under-resourced, the whole thing. So um, the more compassion we can give out or take in is what we can give out. So the more we realize it, I think that's, a, for me, a big way to help um, care providers is just be super compassionate. Ek is in beset van my vrouw, whatever the case may be. Ek wil net graag sê, dat 
um, ons moet allemaal baie versichtig wees. Um, alles wat Lucinda sê, hoor ek, en ek moet net sê, na 25 jaar van altijd aan de mense eerste sit, en jy weet die afgestomtheid wat ek self ontwikkel het, en my kinders het in die proces um, definitief aan die peil gerei. Um, o oh goed, dit is seker verkeerde uitdrukking, ek gebruik altijd my uitdrukking verkeerd. Maar, on, jy verstaan, <laughs> O, ons moet baie voorzichtig wees, want die Lucinda's en die Catherine's en die mense is nodig, maar as jy burn-out ervaar, werkelijke rechtige burn-out, en jou familie, um, jy weet, ek, ek kan nie eens dink wat Lucinda's se, se familie moet deurgaan op een dagelijkse basis nie. Jy weet, ek het nooit mense in my omgeving ingebring nie, maar ek was baie dikvuls, vir jare en jare. Ek het geslaap van my kinders my nodig gehad het. Ek was nie by verjaarsdag per tykies nie. Ek was oproep, ek was angstig. Ek het um, definitief, definitief afgestomp geraak. Um, en ek dink aan hy lieflike verpleegsterkie in die, in die flik. Nou, my sykie het meer op haar kerst ook as wat enig iemand kan. Sy probeer met, ek dink Gideon, jy is haar boyfriend in die flik, is jy nie? Ja, ja. Ja, ja. Ja, sy probeer met jou en al jou drama deel Da's geld issues, da's reis issues, da's compassion issues. Um, en ons verpleegsters, baie van ons verpleegsters, soos wat Kath of Lucinda gesê het, selle met die politie is onderbetaal en oorwerk, en wat doen hulle? Hulle werk extra skofte, hulle moonlight, hulle raak nog moer, hulle sien nog minder hulle kinders. Maar nou raak ek weer opgewonde, so ek wou dit net bijlaat, hy is dit. Nee, ja, absoluut, baie, baie dankie. Um, ja, soos wat, jy weet, om het saam te bring is, dit is, dit, dit klink nou of eenvoudig, maar die antwoord is op die ouwe van die dag in liefde gebaseerd. Dit is, uh, jy weet, die mens moet, mens moet compassion uitgee, maar dan ook hierdie, ja, iets waarvan, waarmee ek baie vir die eenselvig is, jy, jy moet jouself in een positie kan sit waar jy oké okay is om te gee. Nee, dit is jou, ja. Um, ek, wil, ek wil vinnig kyk na een klein videoclip van, van die verpleegster by, by Terren wat my meisie speel in die flik. Uh, John, uh, ons producer, jy kan waar haar die clip speel, dan soos nene weer by julle. I have to change you, Mrs. No! Johnson. No! <laughs> Hoeveel morfie net sy gekry? Where's Amy? I'll kick you. It's me, mommy. It's Amy. <laughs> Laat ek het doen. About time. Wat is die veronderstelling te beteken? Jy weet wat hy beteken. Kry jou kop uit die wolkes aan my hand. They're stealing my things, Amy. Lilies and chrysanthemums. It's against the law. I was thinking about the cake, and uh, <laughs> you're right, fruitcake is traditional. Not listening to me, my girl. They keep letting these colors in here. <clears throat> they're letting the colors in here, and they're stealing come, mommy, from me. Come, mommy. They're stealing come, my mommy, money. Mommy, they're shifty butters. Come, let me just get this out from under you. And then we can talk about our baby cat. Okay. Liar! You're a liar! I know your tricks. You think I'm stupid. You get out of here. Get out! You know, we were talking about getting pregnant this year. Mm. But it's probably better to save. I never liked him, you know. Babies are so expensive. He's poison, Amy. And you know it, my girl, believe me. <laughs> Poor little Amy. Poor little Amy. Amy is gone. There is no Amy. She has never been here. What? What? Amy. I love you, Mommy. Amy. Amy. Sure. Ja, so daar, daar is die samenvatting van dit ook in die, in die film. En jy weet wat die, wat die toneel vir my so relevant maak tot die gesprek tot dispaar is, 
Daar is hier die uitdagings in die publieke sector natuurlijk en uh, in die praktijk in jouw werk. Maar een mens, een mens kan niet nie jouw eigen leven ook samen Je weet, jij jij kan niet alles net bij die bij die ingang los niet. Dat is die mens is toch een vloeibare ding. So dit, dit laat mij dan denken aan Oké, okay, als een mens ook denkt aan die acteersproces en hoe, hoe komt trauma in die en is, hoe, hoe laat een mens jezelf achter, waar begin die self en waar eindig je karakter, waar, je weet hoe, hoe bereid een mens voor? So Inge, die, die volgende vraag is eigenlijk voor jou is, um, hoe, ja, hoe raak een mens ontsla of hoe processeer mens die fysische trauma van ons spel, jy weet wat, as ek kyk na die toneel, daar is baie fysische aspekte van dit, jy weet, en, en ek dink uit my eie ervaring uit is, ek kan vir myself logisch sê, ek gaan nie nou in die rechte leven dier hierdie nie, dit is een toneelstuk ja. of dit is film of so, maar die lijf gaan steeds dier die selfde proces, so daar gaan steeds trauma evers, jy weet, so, ja, ek, ek wil graag by jou hoor, is hoe, ja, how do you get rid of the physical trauma um, of acting? Oh, sorry, sorry, ek gaan na Engels praat julle, sorry. Um, I, I think it, it, it depends on the role, like, but some some roles, you don't need you don't need to shake it off. It's all year, you know, it's like you dealing with technicalities, it's you thinking about the um, continuity and where you're sitting. Um, but some 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 roles you do actually have to do something like with Chantal in this film. I, I was actually <clears throat> really irresponsible in a sense because I I never employed a system. I never I never I never went through a decompression. Like I should have probably done something like tremor therapy, mm. which is what you see in the wild. Like wild animals do that naturally. Like the bookie has a narrow escape with a lioness and it shakes shakes off that trauma you know um i should have done that but i didn't um i thought i could deal with it and um actually run right about the time you sent me these questions i was like oh wow actually that makes sense now because every time i watch the trailer i just i'm cry there's water streaming out of my eyes and i feel some sort of sensation yeah so i think that chantelle was never really properly processed um I should have just I should have gone into that 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 trembling therapy, you know, and I should have just I should have just followed the bookie and I didn't follow the bookie because I intellectualized and I was like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. But then every time I watch the bloody trailer, I'm like, there's water streaming down my face. So I'm like, okay, there's something there. Yeah. I think in um while I was filming it, um okay, Chantal was quite a number, okay. Um <laughs> She was a number. So, so how I would um, sort of uh, get back to myself in between the different days of shooting, sh it was uh, I can I can I can just say the sh the, the power of shower, <laughs> <laughs> and I and showering and washing myself and then taking the bloody dreadlocks off and just running my fingers through my actual hair. And having a clean face was so grounding, but um, yeah, I was. I, I guess looking back, I was quite irresponsible with with uh, with with. Uh, um, I'm trying to get back to your question. Your question was how do you get rid of the process? Like so I, I, I didn't really Shower. have a system at the time. I just showered. Um, <laughs> but considering yeah. my res my my the my like sort of knee jerk thing every time I see the trailer or I even think back to Chantal, I think there's a little bit of PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think, I think uh, and with all of all of you ladies, I think we need to start shaking <laughs> or something. We have to do some sort of, you know, like I mean, I'm not yeah. by any means what I did to what you guys did, which is actual earth angels. But um, yeah, so that was that was my process. I, I was kind of, yeah, I didn't and to I, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't do it by, yeah. 
Yeah, Neil, uh, and, and to follow on from that is if you, you know, ironically, uh, the former part of this this webinar was to how to how to process trauma or how to get rid of it. But my next question to you, Inga, is actually how, as a as an actor, as a performer, as a musician, as anything, you know, you call yourself a professional feeler, which I love, you know. Um, but how do you how do you open yourself up to that? How do you make yourself vulnerable? To, how do you protect yourself? Is it is it is it a process? Is it a mental process where you start mentally and you work logically through it, and the physical follows that, or do you throw your body into it and see where this material, where the writing or the scene or the world of the film takes you? Oh, you've just made like a question sandwich there, so I'll, I'll tackle it. Um, so basically, um, usually usually it starts as a, as a mental thing. So say I get uh, sides to an audition, then I'll read it and I'll try, I'll try my best to understand. I'm like, who is this character? I, I try to understand the scene, which is very important when you're doing an audition. But I usually get a mental picture. I usually like get a mental picture, but... Um, I, I have to understand what's happening in the in, in. I need to understand who the character is. Then I can move into the physical side of it, and then I can start animating it. With Chantal, I want to just go back to Chantal because I don't want to, um, you know. With Chantal, I, I had an actual an actual person in mind. Um, I knew this girl that became homeless. She, uh, she well, she landed up on the street because of mental illness and drug addiction and she actually had a boy that was taken away from her eventually so i sort of i was a witness to this lady's transformation because she was kind of like i suppose a regular person at one point and then and then her life just took a tumble and so i would over the years i would see her and 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 to be like I, she used it was it was like the transformation was astounding and i think I used to be really, I, I, I used to be really scared of her because I felt in that moment I was like, that could be me, that could be anyone. Like that sort of, you know what I mean? Like that can happen to anyone. Anyone can land up in that situation. Anyway, so she was very much on my mind while okay. I was full, but that was still in the mental phase. But then I still had to become Chantal, which is a completely different thing. Um, what, what this homeless person lady um gave me was uh, she gave me access to empathy so then i had that but i still had to become chantal and then so when it came to chantal my process was um i i would just i mean the first the first scene we shot um was the hospital scene where she arrives at the hospital with the receptionist which is quite a intense scene i think we'll, we'll um, have a look at that just now but yeah yeah, yeah scene. So basically what I did was <clears throat> I made myself ill. I made myself feel very sick. I would like sort of spin around continuously to the point where I was completely squinted, felt really ill. I was bashing myself into walls. I asked Lo to slap me, <laughs> which he just, he was like, okay, I'll do whatever you want me to. And I just, I was just like, just, just slap me. So I used my body a lot to just to uh, circle around to your question again. It starts sometimes stuff starts it starts with like a mental idea, but then with Chantal it started as a mental concept, but then I had to on the day is had to use my body. Mm. And I had to make myself feel really ill. Yeah. And then there's also something magical that happens um, where sometimes you 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 get caught up in this collective unconscious like riptide where all of a sudden you just you just feel every you feel everything you're like you know it's like at your fingertips like you're feeling you're feeling all these different emotions like you can't explain it and then to get yeah. back to your question of how do I protect myself how I protect myself so, so that's great for acting it's wonderful that I can go into that but then how do I protect myself and the only way I protect, protected myself was literally joy 
And that was doing really stupid stuff, like laughing and sitting on the floor and playing with a dog and being a kid. That was the thing that grounded me. That was the thing that broke it because no. she was so, she was a commitment. Like yeah. she was a commitment. Like she, no. she, she, I felt like a tourist in hell. Like it was moribund. It was like, I was, I was like walking on the edge of death. And I had to go there. There was no way that I could do it over here. I had to, I had to, <clears throat> I had to sacrifice. I had to physically sacrifice that. Hmm. Uh, I don't. I, mm. well, I don't know how to intellectualize. It was just. Yeah, um, man, I, I, I would. I I, I, <laughs> yeah, man. I, I think that is that is very interesting. As you know, what you physically on yourself must do. Om ja. die trauma te beleef. Dit geef vir ons een glimps in wat die realiteit is, wat Lucinda, wat Siska, wat Catherine, wat jylle ook ervaar is. Dit is, jy weet, as, as ons trauma moet, if we need to manufacture it from nothing, that, that, that is what it takes, doing that kind of stuff to yourself, jy weet. En ek denk, Sorry, ja. ik heb het even niet waarvan ik wat ik waarvan ik vroeger gebruikt heb. Ik denk hoe ik net vinnig. Ik denk wat gebeurt het is. Ik heb amper reverse trembling therapy gedaan, waar ik amper oud trauma uit mijn lijf uit gering. En dan maybe that helped me get into into playing Chantal. En I was recycling the trauma in a sense. You know what I mean? Like you could look at it that. I don't know. Dit kom ook weer terug na hierdie ding toe, is waar, waar gaan sê dit? Nee, ek, um, ek uh, ons hart loop amper uit tyd uit, en daar is soveel goed wat ek nog veel wil vraag, maar ek wil, ek wil net vir net sê, die, as ek terugdink aan toe 9-11 gebeur het, ek was een kind, maar die ding wat ek ontdou, en is een baie, een, is een baie specifieke ding, is ek het ontdou hoe moeg amal was, hoe moeg allemaal vir my gelijk het. Al die groot mense was half, jy weet, en dit is die onderliggende trauma, as ons nou kyk na die pandemie, waar dit gaan sit, dit is onder ons, soos een rivier, jy weet. Ja. Maar ek wil hee, ons moet net vinnig kyk na hierdie, hierdie klip, uh, hierdie stikkie wat, enge wat jy genoem het van jou, dit is die heel eerste ding wat jy geskiet het, en wat vir my uitstaan, is die absolute uit putting van hierdie onophoudende lewe van trauma. Ek dink John uh, ja, speel vir ons die clip en dan kan ek, dan wil ek het, ja, wil ek nog veel honderde goed vir my. Excuse me, bro. Yes, can I help you? I hope so, my boy is missing. He's only eight years old and I just stepped out. Uh, um, I don't know, I, t- I told him to stay in the house every time. I, I just had to leave the, 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 for a moment this morning. What's going on now? Are you hurt? No, I'm, I'm fine with it. Uh, Jonah's not in the place we stay. How old's the boy? He's eight. Uh, with a little red and blue jacket? A little hoodie. Oh, thank you, I can't tell you. He's with the black guy. What, 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 do, you, what do you mean? They were here earlier, but they left again, you know, the guy. Oh, no, oh, fuck. I don't know what you mean. I, Jonah doesn't know any black guys. Watch your tongue. Okay. We didn't lose your child, okay? So if you're worried, you need to go to the police. You understand? The police. Uh, I, I understand, but I mean, I mean, if they were here. Do you have a problem going to the police? Yes, I didn't think so. I have to get back to my work. Go to the cop shop and... Ask them, understand. Unless you want me to call them for you. We don't do lost children over here. Okay. How come you don't me go? Listen, don't give a trip me now. Okay. I don't know what your sad story is, but I can guess. Look at you. What would your mother say? Is it fucking ernstig? All the dragies is all the same.
nice to show Marie. I don't have a job as a fucking receptionist at the hospital, but I can't even get in the gates. Now, I'm not going to be in the scatterball. I don't know. You know, I'm like, fuck all. Listen to me, I'm going to go to the house to your kids. No, you don't. You sit the whole day here in that cock fucking empty of your judgments, and it makes you important. But you're not really important. Or is it wrong, John Marie? I get my cock. But you know what? I'm a good man. But I'm security, Rook. Hmm? Oh, you have a security, Rook. Ja, hij spit het in wonderlijk in ontstellend, het is alles terzelfde tijd. Je weet. Zo, je weet, dit is voor mij zo. Dit is such a big topic that we don't talk enough about, I feel. You know, and especially from all of your different avenues of trauma and how you experience it. So. Almost in closing, or as the last stretch of our conversation, we've got about 10, 10 15 minutes left. Is, uh, yeah, I will, I will frog as Jelle, Elkin van Jelle, Levens of Werke beroepen, areas waar Jelle trauma ervaar. As jylle iets vir die samenleving kon sê, of een gesprek met die samenleving kon aankloop en sê, hierdie is wat ons meer van nodig het, om ons trauma deegliker of meer effectief te proceseer. What is something that we can keep in mind or do for each one of your industries that would make the, the processing of trauma better, easier. Yeah, I think we'll begin with Siska. Sure. Gideon, this is a very difficult question. As I now, as I must talk, you know, as a pleaster, better conditions, een beetje meer geld dat dat verkleest dus niet zoveel. Je weet hoeveel tijd hoeft te werken. Je weet to make end ends meet. En ik denk je weet dus dat die die liefelijke collega wat ik vroeger geschakeld heb van dan zei je weet haar opleiding het voorziening gemaakt voor burn-out en Je weet op, je weet om dit te erkennen, te weten wat om daar aan te doen. Je weet net om verpleegsters om om beter naar alles zelf te kijken. In in ja, zo. Ik weet niet. Jij vang mij een beetje uit die zo. Nee, dat is een dat is een grote vraag. Maar bij jou, dank je. Ja, Lucinda, kan ik voor jou vragen? Zo, Gideon, ik ben currently building a woman's center in Steenbuk. Almost near to completion. So I'm building a women's center with 26 shipping containers. Wow. And the one thing that I'm building in currently is I want to form partnerships with the professionals that can teach me skit therapy so I can skit the trauma off and, and bring women into our spaces because we don't. Yes, of course. I do not have or there isn't enough safe spaces for women leaders, for frontline workers to come. I want to form partnerships with tour agencies so that the nurses can go on the garden route tour and camp in the bush and sit around the fire and just breathe. And this is what I, 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 I want to start connecting people to yeah. these. I want to promote places like the Grail Women's Center in Claremont, for an example, where there's an in-house psychologist that does deep health and wellness and everything. And I agree with you, Siska. We as women are so underpaid and we are so overworked, but we need to find the funding to make these things a reality. And we should start holding each other accountable and have check-ins with each other in terms of, where are you? Are you okay? You know, I've heard about this. There's a hike, there's a walk in Silver Mines. Well, we have to look at safety all the time. And yeah. connect with hiking clubs to say, do you want to adopt us? 
frontline workers, ambulance people, police women and men, or just nurses, and take us to the dam in silver mines and let's just walk this trauma off. But it's not a luxury anymore to debrief and to do self-care. It has become a necessity. And if you don't do it, then burnout will be the third pandemic that most of us will sit in this country. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's, yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. The, I, what I want to say there is the, and for everyone listening or watching this is the, on Facebook, we have the Stum Film Facebook page. And our intention with this is to create a space where people can connect with these things to bring together and we're going to post all these webinars. Uh, there are two other webinars that I'll mention later coming up, which are fantastic. And Lucinda, maybe we can connect you with some people via this page, you know, and you can let us know what you need and we can keep that conversation alive there. And that counts for everyone, you know, because we really, so part of this is, is, yeah, we need to speak about it, but in speaking, it needs to lead to doing. It needs to, because there's so many wonderful things to do here as well. Not only necessary, but really incredible human things to do. So yeah, amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So please let's stay in touch and chuck all of that in a very neat way on a on Facebook. Yeah. Catherine. Yeah, again, I think I feel like Cisco, it's, it's such a difficult question that I don't know the answer to. I mean, I, I, the first thing that springs to mind is just, um, is pay and remuneration, you know, as good as I think our biggest thing that, that we face in our profession is burnout. And I think, you know, it's just from um, having to not being, have the, not being able to say no when we need to say no so you know we work in a private capacity as it is so we take on clients and when you paid so little for the amount of hours that you're putting on you don't have the luxury to say no and when you can't say no it's very quickly and you know, the life of being on call is a and no one in this panel knows it better in my opinion than probably Lucinda and Siska but being on call is exceptionally 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 draining um and that's i think a big part of burnout so i think if we <laughs> were better remunerated for what we did we could do an you know a certain amount of clients that that we know would be able to hold us you know by them financially but not kill us so um the first thing that springs to mind and i think just you know structured Structured groups, um, where there are there are some, but not enough. And I think that there's almost like a we always got to make it compulsory. I think as women, we so often will put our stuff aside, um, and we, you know, I think let's talk about that being held accountable to one another of really having, you know, forcing ourselves to address what we face and to talk about it and to get it out, to walk it out, shake it out, tap it out. I mean, even. You know, Inga was mentioning how she probably didn't process Chantal enough, you know, because that's what we do as women. We're like, okay, first the kids, first the husbands, first the clients, first everybody else. And um, we have to stop, uh, we have to stop each other from doing it, I think, is I think a big thing that we can do is call each other out when we see it happening and say, hey, you haven't done X, Y, and Z. How the hell did you process that? You know, um, do you really want to take on your seventh client for that month, eighth or ninth clients? Can you cope? And um, yeah, just bring back that sense of community and hold each other accountable and mm. ask for what we're worth. I guess is a big thing. Learning, I know it's different for nurses in the public sector, but yeah, in private, in private care, I think we undervalue ourselves. So it's you know, I think oh, you know, if you're not charge too much because you want everybody to be able to access the support access your your care and um, but then as the experience your family suffers for it you know you, you, you miss freaking birthdays and you miss um music titles and big events you know um and i don't know if that's worth it at the end of the day um 
mm. that will spare regret when you're older. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but no, absolutely. And I mean, it's something that that I hear, yeah, from from everyone is it's it's access, communication, and resource. You know, and those are the things that uh, you, uh, globally, all over, it needs. We got to be better. We got to do better. Um, thank you. Yeah, and uh, lastly, Inga. I mean, yeah, I've, we can speak about this forever in our co personal capacity, but I think it's a wonderful uh, topic in and of itself. Is yeah, what what do you think the artistic community can do to to process the inherent trauma of making something? Okay, so I mean, I'm by no means on the same level as 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 you you lovely ladies. Um, you are actually from heaven, but you just happen to be living on earth. So with actors, we it's very Neptunian, and it's in this sort of fog. It's 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 cinema. It's 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 imagination. I think I can't answer as a collective. I, I can't I can't I can't answer the question. But I think if you take responsibility for yourself as a performer and you try to remain a clean, pure channel to whatever character you are embodying, I think that's good. For example. Um, what we were talking about earlier, and I think you know whether it is 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 doing something physical or doing like a neutralizing activity after playing a really intense role. But I think it's really important to look after yourself as an actor because you are a channel. I like to look at as a I like to look at my craft as a form of channeling. Hmm. Some people might disagree with me and think I'm crazy, but I do think it is a form of channeling. So. To answer your question, I think it's up to the individual to just keep, yeah. to keep your channel clear for the next yeah. thing. And I, th I think that and, really and, and sometimes the, the, the means justify justifies the ends, like do whatever you have to do, but make sure that it's, you know, like you clean it every now and then. It's like a, yeah. it's like a pipe, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 and I mean that, that resonates so beautifully with, with what you were saying is that of course there is this passion to do it. That's why we do these things. But in a healthy way, we we need to put ourselves first. Otherwise, everyone that depends on our caregiving yeah. is not going to be optimally served. And we need to create a society that cares for the caregiver. Yeah. For sure. I um, I I can continue speaking forever, uh, <laughs> but I I am deeply, I am deeply humbled that uh, I could be a part of this conversation, and it was wonderful to meet all of you. And thank you, thank you very much for for being here. I um, I feel very lucky. And if you have any links or websites, please share it with us and let's continue these conversations because um, I think something like the trauma of the caregiver, it requires a vigilance in conversation. Otherwise, it might fall below again where, where it's been for, for too long. Um, but thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, ladies. And thank you, Gideon. And thank you, Laura. And thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, no, and I'll say, I'll say in closing to uh, to everyone who's listening, I, I really want to thank Kaka and Carl um, for providing this platform and Uruku Media, to John Savage, our fearless producer behind the scenes, and if you like this conversation and you want more of it. There is a wonderful conversation happening tomorrow night at the same time at 7.30. It's the relationship and addiction. And then on Monday the 12th, uh, there's another conversation, what we are not saying about gender-based violence. Both are moderated by Marianne Tam, and they have a host of incredible guests as well. Um, 
yeah, from me, Gideon, thank you so much for being here. If you want to watch the film Stum, it's currently on DSTV box office. Go like everything Stum related on all the social media links. Thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Jacket on. What's your name? Jenna. What's the relationship between you and the boy? Not an easy ride, is it? Life is long. This is not the end.